Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earlier crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I picked up this Picket Fence Studio Santa Claus is Coming, or Santa Claus Comes Tonight stamp. I am a sucker for a cute Santa, and I'm going to watercolor it. I have some of this Artist Loft watercolor paper. I'm using my Windsor and Newton watercolor set. I've got a palette. I've got Versafine or Versaclair Nocturne Black Ink and some clear embossing powder um, so that I can kind of create little walls around my color watercolor sections because I'm just not that great at it yet. I will be stamping on the watercolor paper on the smoother side of the watercolor paper with that Versaclair ink because it is waterproof, but also so that I can heat emboss it I will be not making a card in this video because this video is going up on Monday the 25th and Monday the 25th is also the day for my Christmas on the 25th videos. So Monday gets two videos, yay. So one will be the coloring, one will be the card creation. I cannot think if there's anything else I need to tell you about the coloring. So let's jump into the crime. Our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of Arizona. Now, prior to 1863, Arizona and New Mexico were one territory known as the New Mexico Territory. The journey to statehood for the territory, territory of Arizona was one of the longest of all the states in the Union. Why it took so long to become a state is like most historical events, complicated and not exactly straightforward. A few of those complications were slow population growth. Um, there just wasn't a lot of people settling in Arizona at that time. While Arizona had lots of natural resources, there wasn't a really easy way to transport those goods to areas outside the Arizona Territory. There was also fear that some of the Confederate sympathizers who had fled from the South to the Southwest would try to revive that Southern style of life. When the idea of Arizona statehood was first proposed, it was suggested that New Mexico and Arizona become one state. Then, on June 20th of 1910, Arizona was authorized to become a state by Congress. The authorization allowed Arizona to hold a constitutional convention so that the state's constitution could be ratified or voted upon by the residents. When Arizona submitted its constitution, it included a provision that allowed for the recall of judges. President Howard Taft did not like that provision and he vetoed the statehood. Um, the next day, August 16th of 1911, Congress passed a resolution admitting Arizona to the Union on the condition that they removed that judiciary recall from their constitution. That allowed President Taft to approve their set, that resolution, and on January 6th, 1912, Arizona's residents voted to remove the recall provision. So that is how Arizona became a state. Now, in Arizona, if you cut down an endangered cactus like the saguaro, you can face up to a year in prison. And that is because it takes up to 100 years for a saguaro cactus to regrow an arm, especially in areas of low precipitation. Billy the Kid allegedly killed his first victim in Bonita, Arizona. The legendary 1881 gunfight at the OK Corral in the Arizona Territory town of Tombstone is considered the most famous shootout in the American Old West, and it lasted only 30 seconds. The state of Arizona is large enough to fit all of New England plus the state of Pennsylvania inside its borders. Women in Arizona were granted the right to vote eight years before national suffrage was passed. There aren't any dinosaur fossils at the Grand Canyon because the rocks that make up the Grand Canyon are older than dinosaurs. Arizona has the largest percentage of land designated as Native American lands and 21 federally recognized Native American tribes. 
Pluto was discovered um, with a, a telescope at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff in 1930. And we are not going to debate, but Pluto is still a planet. Thank you very much. I'm a child of that time period. <laughs> You can, in fact, find roadrunners running up to 17 miles an hour to escape their enemies. However, you probably will not find any coyotes with dynamite. The best preserved meteor crater in the world is in Winslow, Arizona. And mine inspector is an elected government position in Arizona. Possibly Arizona's most famous criminal, a man named Ernesto Miranda, is the reason we have the Miranda laws. You know, you have the right to remain silent thing. Yep, that comes from Arizona. The Arizona Cardinals are the longest running continuous franchise in the NFL going clear back to 1898. And Arizona is the only state except Hawaii that does not observe daylight savings time because they're smart enough to know you can't take an hour off the morning and add it to the night and make the day longer. It's still dark whether you're getting home in the dark or going to work in the dark. It's still dark. And Arizona is the home of the girl in the iron box. Let's start our story today in Tucson in 1934. Tucson was a small, isolated town that seemed to have avoided a lot of the troubles that raged in the outside world. Until... The residents wit witnessed the capture of John Dillinger, Dillinger and his gang in 1934, um, early in the year, January, February time frame. But even after that, the residents who lived in Tucson believed that they lived in a haven away from crimes that plagued most of the rest of the country. Tucson was the home of Fernando Robles. He was the owner of the Robles Electric Company, and his wife's name was Helen. Together, they were parents of two daughters, Sylvia Ann and June Cecilia. Fernando was the son of one of Tucson's wealthiest residents, Barnabé Robles, who was a Mexican cattle rancher that had settled in Arizona. All seemed right in the small corner of their world until about 3 p.m. on April 25th of 1934, when young June was taken by an unknown man. He was described by a witness, Marguerite Smith, who was there at the school to pick up her own child, as a dirty, emaciated man wearing glasses. She said that June was forced into this man's Ford that was parked outside the school. And it seemed to Marguerite that June was saying no to the man as he put her in the backseat of the car. And she thought that it was a family affair and did not want to intrude. June had been walking to the home of her aunt after school when she was grabbed. The scene was so foreign that people began to wonder if it really was a kidnapping at all. I mean, even Marguerite thought it was a family affair. Then, later that day, in a parking lot on Church Street, an unknown man gave 25 cents to a boy named Ro um, let me see if I can pronounce this right, Rosalio Estrada, and told him to deliver a note to Fernando at the electric company offices. So at five o'clock that evening, Rosalio, Rosario, Rosalio, there we go, handed Fernando the note. The note demanded $15,000 for the return of June. It included details of how to pay the ransom. Today, that would be almost $345,000. The note also included a threat to June's life if their demands were not met. Of course, Fernando responded quickly and he gave Ros Rosalio a reply to send back to the man on, in the Church Street parking lot. But when Rosalio got there, the man was gone. There was nowhere to be seen. The parking lot was located across the street from the electric company offices. Now, newspapers later reported that the Robles family wanted to keep the police out of the loop, but somehow the police found out. And even though the city wasn't a stranger to crime, nothing like this had ever happened there before. By nightfall, police had been notified and they promptly blocked off all the roads into and out of town. In the morning after the kidnapping, the sheriff's office put out a call for help. 
Within hours, 400 men volunteered to help in the searches of every home in town. They left no stone or bed unturned. The police office even searched all the mail in the boxes in town for ransom notes. Volunteers even armed themselves, themselves and headed to every potential hideout they knew of in southern Arizona and the Mexico border. Investigators knew the clock was ticking. Around noon on the 26th, a second note was delivered to June's grandfather, Barnaby. It read, quote, Mr. Robles, child safe. We are willing to reduce the ransom to $10,000 if you act quickly. Child will be returned safely as per your instructions. Obey instructions. Signed, Z. This made investigators wonder if Barnaby was the real money target all along. You see... As I stated previously, Barnaby was one of Southern Arizona's wealthiest men. He had come to the United States in 1864 at the age of seven from Mexico. And the um, family stories say that he and his mother crossed the border on burrows with all of their worldly possessions hanging over the animals' backs. Barnaby and his wife, Joaquina, eventually opened a store in Tucson, and they then were able to amass a fortune between the store, ranching, and real estate. And they became one of the community's most prominent families, even having the town of Robles Junction, which was west of Tucson, named after them. Of course, this added detail of maybe grandpa being the target meant drama for the News Corps. Local papers grabbed onto the idea that this rich grandfather was actually the either the target or the person they were going after for the money. And they began calling him a cattle baron and, um, quote, stately, keen-eyed Spanish aristocrat, which is weird because he's from Mexico and not Spain, but whatever. There was another unique family connection to the, the newspapers were quick to reveal. June's uncle father had a twin brother named Carlos. Carlos was the assistant county attorney. Yeah, so talk about lots of reasons to take this girl. Um, Carlos was able to secure an airplane to fly, an airplane, wow, sorry, words are hard, to fly out over the desert looking for any signs of June or her kidnappers. After the air support was added to the investigation, it became known as, quote, the greatest man had ever staged in the West. It was so huge that um, it publicly gathered 100 telephone tips to the police in the first five days. In a small town, that's got to be pretty substantial. However, the size of the manhunt also created a circus-like atmosphere. Police were searching abandoned mine shafts. They were scouring caves like Colossal Cave, which was a historic or a known hideout for robbers. And the circus is well known for, well, crazies. The crazies came out from wherever they were hiding. Um, one owner of a cafe near Fort Huachuca reported seeing two men armed with multiple styles of guns carrying a child. Another witness, a woman, claimed that she saw the men attempt to feed the child eggs while she was sitting in their car, but the child wouldn't eat them. Convinced that these men and the child were headed to Mexico, police swarmed the border area and the remote canyons of the Huachuca Mountains. They enlisted the aids of Apache scouts. But it turns out that the woman made it all up and was arrested. Police Chief Wallard said, quote, we have run down clue after clue, which has faded into nothing. I never worked a case in which we had so little information. In, for his part, Fernando did the best he could to find his daughters. He tried to re reconnect with the kidnappers. He even snuck away the first few nights after June was taken and followed the ransom note instructions. He drove along the three roads that were designated by the note at exactly 9 p.m. as he was instructed. 
The instructions also indicated that if he saw a white string across the road as he drove by, he was to throw money out the window and keep driving. The problem was the ransom note and the instructions were published in its entirety in the newspaper. The Robles family decided after Fernando's failed attempts to make contact that the publication and the intensity of the manhunt had scared off the kidnappers. And worse, they feared that they would carry out the threats they had made against June. In a public appeal to the man or men who held his child, Fernando told the kidnappers that he would call off the police and their search if, he, if they would agree to make a deal with him. He said, quote, I do not mean to discredit the officers. God knows they have done everything they could do, but it has been no use and only one thing now is left. I must get in touch with these people. I want my baby back. But Fernando was a wise man, and he wasn't just going to go on any wild goose chase that popped up with anybody who reached out to him after this public plea. He had instructions. His instructions to the kidnappers were very clear that unless they could, one, send him a piece of June's dress and her answers to, ver to several personal questions, he would know that they were not the kidnappers and they did not have his daughter, and he would not even entertain them. He would not even consider it worth it. But nothing worked. There were no new developments. Meanwhile, the Robel family had gone into, seclu into seclusion to protect their other daughter and their privacy. This horrible event was happening just two years after the world famous Lindbergh kidnapping and newspapers were starting to compare the crimes. There was another rumor that seemed to pop up every once in a while. It seems like, you know, when news got slow, this would pop up. And people believed that at least one member of the Dillinger gang had been, that had been captured in Tucson earlier that year had escaped from jail and taken June as revenge on the Tucson police. This theory is based on a statement Don Dillinger made when he was arrested he referred to the Tucson police as Hick Town Cops. The Hick Town Cops arrested him, but whatever. In May, Grandpa Barnaby made a secret trip across the border to Petitiquito, a town in Mexico. But like everything else in this case, the trip didn't stay secret for long. Many people wondered why he would go to Mexico and if it had anything to do with his missing granddaughter. Barnaby eventually revealed the reason for his little journey. He had gone to the district of Sonora to visit a psychic said to have supernatural powers that attracted Mexican citizens from miles around for help with their problems. Barnaby said he spent two hours with the man that he called a seer and took his counsel seriously as he returned to the United States, commenting, quote, he hoped this little journey into Sonora will lead lead to finding June. This led to a more focused search of Mexico that only brought more false hopes. One tip led investigators to the bottom of a mine shaft in Sonora where they believed little June's body would be located, but like all of the other tips thus far, it was untrue. June's family was suffering greatly, not only from her disappearance, but from the false tips and lack of information. In fact, Helen, June's mom, was suffering from very serious anxiety. And Barnaby told reporters that the family's suffering was becoming unbearable. On May 7th, the case took another very bizarre turn. Police received a third ransom note. In this note, the kidna kidnappers gave all the correct answers to June's father's questions then subjected the family with more threats toward June. The note read, quote, Now if you play dirty, we will play dirty. Your child is okay. Keep spies away. Why don't you do as told? You have tried to trap us. We know what you have done. If you had listened to us, your child would be with you. Now down to business. Your child will be released 48 hours after money is delivered. We are going to shoot straight. We will keep our word. 
now or never XYZ obey. The most unusual thing about this letter isn't the odd wording and it isn't the threats. It was the method of delivery. This note was shoved under the door at the county attorney's office in the Pima County Courthouse building. This caused a more circus-like environment, if you can even believe it. Investigators now talked to each other in whispers. They looked over their shoulders. They really believed that the kidnapper had a mole in their office. And just when you think things can't get any weirder, there was another bizarre break in the case. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. Um, earlier in, in the days of the investigation, June's grandmother, Joaquina, had said, quote, she is here in Tucson, our June. I feel it. It was done by people in Tucson. Oh, there are some cruel people that live in this city. Turns out she was right about both things. Okay, so fast forwarding again to the 14th of May, when this investigation just goes from weird to weirder, the governor, who's in Phoenix, not Tucson, got a letter with a Chicago postmark. This letter described where in the Tucson desert June could be found, but one sentence of the note led authorities to believe they were going on a rescue, not a recovery mission. It read, quote, you will find the body covered with a load of cactus. So immediately the governor sends the highway patrol to the desert. Then he and the states or the the state's county attorney, a man named Clarence, Clarence Houston, and his assistant, June's uncle Carlos, headed to the area. So for two hours, the men searched the one-and-a-half-mile area southeast of St. Joseph's Academy, finding nothing. The Robles family gave up, believing that this, too, was a false lead, until Fernando saw a cactus in the shape of a cross, and he just believed, he just knew that this was the right place so he begged his brother and um, Clarence to not give up, to continue to look. And soon after that, Uncle Carlos heard his boss Clarence shouting his name. Clarence had tripped over a mound of dirt. And recognizing that it was not natural, he swept the dirt away and he found June buried alive in an underground cage one of her ankles chained to a spike. He leaned into the cage, asking June if she remembered him and if she was afraid of him. And as June told him she was not afraid, her uncle Carlos came running up to where they were. Carlos later told the news that he did not even notice that his legs were covered in cacti. He did not notice the pain because he was, quote, too busy crying like a baby. Whatever happiness they felt as she was found and still alive was quickly replaced with red hot rage. The iron cage that June had been kept in was too short for her to stand upright. If there had been any amount of rain, she would have drowned. There were air holes punched in the top and food was shoved through a trap door. Her only source of water was two filthy iron cans and her bathroom was a pot in the ground. June was pulled out of the ground dirty and covered with vermin and insects. She was bruised by the shackle around her ankle. Her skin was blotchy. She had, it was burned from the sun beating down on the top of this iron box. And the only thing June said as she was being lifted from her prison in the ground was that she needed to get her report card out. She had gotten her report card from her teacher the day she was taken and she wanted to take it home to show her mom. June was weak and confused and nervous, and while she was being treated medically, she told the police that there were two men that had taken her. They had immediately put her in the box and had visited her four times since she had been taken, four times in 19 days. On one visit, they heard her crying, and they yelled down a pipe into the ground to be quiet or they were going to stab her in the back. Tucson residents were in shock at the news of June's treatment. The county attorney stated that his biggest regret, regret was that Arizona had no capital punishment for this type of a crime. Now that June's found, and it is clear it's a kidnapping, I don't know how it wasn't before, but whatever, 
The FBI is now on the case. Director Hoover put his top assistants in charge of finding the kidnappers, and he gave public speeches and public promises about delivering justice, but nothing came to pass. The only arrest was the, uh, that of a dance hall operator named Oscar Robson. His handwriting was believed to have matched one of the ransom notes. He was investigated for months. He was interrogated. He was kept in jail. But when the case collapsed him, the case against him collapsed, he was released. As the police and the FBI were trying to find the identity of the kidnappers, the press was telling the story of the torture cell rescue. A London newspaper even gave June the distinct honor of being interviewed by a transatlantic phone call. Fernando was given more than one offer to make the story into a movie. He was even offered a $1,000 a day vaudeville tour where June would, be, would reenact her rescue. He stated that he only considered this to put aside money as a reward for the capture of the kidnappers. His motivation was reportedly the many letters of the residents of Tucson telling them how they were now afraid for the safety of their own children because the kidnappers were still at large. There's no record of Fernando ever taking any of those offers, and I cannot imagine any parent wanting to put their child through that trauma for $1,000 a day. Without any new clues or arrests, the Robles kidnapping faded from the news and from public view, but the family was scarred. The sisters were pulled from public school and sent to a private academy where they could be consist consistently supervised. And Helen said she couldn't stand to leave her children alone even for a minute. Grandpa Barnaby stopped traveling to or from his ranch at night because he believed that his business enemies were behind this and that they might try to take him next because they had failed to receive any money from the first kidnapping. The confusion as to the true motive wasn't only a mystery to the family. No one had any answers. Who was the dirty man seen at the school by the witness? Who slipped the third note under the county attorney's office door? If money was the motive, why was June released before it was paid? And what is the connection to Chicago where the, lo where the note with the location of June originated from? A year later, in May of 1935, an unnamed dying man came forward with more evidence that implicated three other people. And Director Hoover and the FBI declared the case solved. But there were no convictions. After 32 months, in December of 1936, a federal grand jury dropped another bombshell. Not only did the jurors on the panel not have enough evidence to indict anyone, they labeled the confusing disappearance as a, air quotes here that you can't see, alleged kidnapping. And with that, the feds wiped their hands of the crime, they wiped their hands of any further investigation, and they sealed the records because that is the custom when a crime has been committed and no one is indicted. One of the grand jury members told the Star newspaper that they used the word alleged because they doubted that any child could have been kept in a buried cage for 19 days and survived. <sighs> okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> June and the Robles family went on to live a rather anonymous life. June never gave any other interviews, even though the case was dug up occasionally. She was married in 1950 to Dan Burt, and they had four children, three sons and a daughter. Her public wedding announcement did not mention her ordeal. June died in September of 2014 at the age of 87 without ever knowing who or why this happened to her. Her family used her married name when they printed her obituary and nobody really noticed until a researcher looking into a different child abduction case emailed her family hoping for more information on June's case. I don't know where to start with this. I am mad at whoever made everything private public. Why were the ransom letters printed in the newspaper? Why, I, I just, why that? Why did the FBI give up? Why did the grand jury think that this was fake? Like what did they know that is not public record that we don't know? 
Like if I could get my hands on records of cases, this would be one of the ones I would want the records for. And I'm going to do a little research and find out if I, if it's like public record now that it's, you know, been nearly a hundred or yeah, been nearly a hundred years. I don't know what the time frame on that is, but I have so many questions and I have so many mixed feelings. Like for real, part of me thinks it could be a family thing, right? But also part of me feels like it was probably somebody just out for money. I just, oh my goodness, I have so many, so many questions. I am curious as to how you all feel about this case. Do you feel like it was botched? Do you feel like it was an inside thing on the family side, an inside affair on the police side? I want to know your gut impression get impressions about this case because I have very conflicting thoughts and feelings and emotions about this. But yeah, oh my goodness, I don't even know. If you want to see how I put this card together, catch the other video that's going up today. Um, I do have photographs. I have a picture of June. This is a picture taken of June at about the time of, of her abduction also have a picture of her family, her mom and her dad and her and her sister. So yeah, super awesome photograph. I love that when there's photographs. Anyway, thanks for hanging out with me today. I have a couple of other videos here I think you might like. I've also added that subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment below. I want to hear your thoughts. Give me a thumbs up. Tell YouTube you like the channel or the video and have a really great day.